Good morning. Can you hear me there? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Tyler. Yes. Thank you. And Hannah, that's you, right, in the iPhone? Yes, yeah. That's good. I, I, it's almost like your name now. I just want to be sure in case other iPhones show up. <laughs> OK, thank you. My, my computer is not working, that's why. So we'll wait. It's, I've got 11.28. I'm going to wait just a couple more minutes. I'm hoping there'll be a, a rush of sign in. And uh, but we'll get going here pretty shortly. OK. Adi, are you there? Uh, yes, Professor, I'm here. Uh, after class, I want to follow up on our conversation last night, OK? OK. Thank you for staying and remind me. Okay. Okay, welcome. I'm going to allow just another minute and then we'll get started. Okay, I'm going to reward you for being prompt by going ahead and getting going. All right. So hold on. Let me get my slides up. Wait, just, I didn't do that right. Hold on a second. <clears throat> All right, so I hope we have more folks joining us, but I'm glad to see you. Appreciate you being prompt. And let me show you what we have, we're going to be doing today. Uh, okay, so we're going to, uh, I read your homework over the past week, and several of you did really well with Waiting Room. And some of you weren't sure what to make of it. So I'm gonna, we're gonna spend a good bit of time today reading and discussing it. And that will be, then we'll move to uh, preparing you for your next essay assignment. You're gonna have three essay choices. You can either write something in response to girl, in response to in the waiting room, or in response to um, uh, the flowers. And I'll explain that better after we get through it. Realize all those pieces are short. We've both will have discussed each of them, but they're easy for you to go back and reread and look at and think about before you write. Uh, I wanted to offer a topic on bullet in the brain, but I was I already had three. I came up with a good one this morning, but I may save it for our next essay. 
So we'll focus uh, for the start this time on in the waiting room, uh, the flowers and uh, girl. All right. So let's see. Just before, I probably should repeat this at homework time, but uh, next week is spring break, so we don't meet next Friday, the 19th. Our next class is going to be 326, two weeks from today. I must, the essay I signed today will be due on Thursday, the 25th. So one way you can think about that, at least those of you who are all caught up on your work, is that you can take your spring break week and write that following week, which would be like a normal class week. Or you can just look at it. I have two weeks to do this essay. And if you start early, you can finish it that much sooner. But you have a good bit of flexibility there because we won't be meeting next week. All right. Any questions about that? OK, let's talk about In the Waiting Room. This is a poem by Elizabeth Bishop. And I want to just say at the start, I think this is a challenging poem. And one of the reasons it's challenging is that there's a mix of really ordinary details and complex ideas. And the complex ideas and suggestions are, can be difficult to take in or, or challenging to take in. So let's go, we'll go slowly. I'm going to prepare you before we read it, and then we'll talk about it after we're done. And let me see, can I hold on a second? I want to just break from this a second to see. Yes, we've got a few more people in, but I hope that we continue to get some to show. Let me go back to our slides. Okay. All right, so I ask you some simple questions just to ground you before you started, and many of you answered these. So let's just let's just see if we can answer these quickly. Who is speaking in this poem? This is about girl, yes. No, this is about in the waiting room. Oh, it's a it's a young lady. I think she's seven, if I remember correctly. Okay, so this is an interesting poem. Wait, she's twelve. No, no, what? You had it right the first time, Tyler. Oh, as I read the, okay, yeah. She's she's six and it says it's three days from her boyfriend or birthday, excuse me. So that's who's, but is the little girl speaking? Wait, I, let's, let's just do this differently. That's who the little, that's who's featured in it. Who's speaking? Who tells the story here? Several of you wrote this correctly. She calls herself Elizabeth and the author's name's Elizabeth. So I think we're to assume this is Elizabeth Bishop speaking for herself. And this is, a, this is an important point. Some of you in Girl referred to Girl uh, as the author speaking. In fiction, generally, the author does not speak directly. The author creates characters who speak. And even if the author creates him, the, him or herself as a narrator, they tend to create a persona that's a mask that's not necessarily them. But in poetry, it's much more common for a, a poem to be linked to the author, even if there's a persona of some sort. But it's fair enough to say that it's Elizabeth speaking and that we're to associate Elizabeth with the author herself. Where does the action take place? Where are they in this poem? Where's in the waiting room of a dentist? Yeah, in the dental office. And thank you, Tyler. For, Tyler's good to speak up. Some others jump in there too. If several of you answered these questions, this isn't hard. They're in a dentist office. And uh, why did they come there? Why did they come to that place? Why is the little girl in the dental's office? To accompany her aunt. Yeah, she's come to her aunt has an her aunt has an appointment, and she's just come to accompany her there. Uh, and we've already said the speaker's six is three days before her birthday. 
What about how old, uh, or that's how old she is in the poem, the, the little girl in the poem. How old is the speaker at the time of the writing? And why, do, why might you think that? You had good answers here. Do we know how old she is? We don't, it doesn't say. But do we think she's still seven? No. No, and why not? Why do we know she's older? Because the, because she... the story is a personal anecdote of hers when she was younger. Yeah, it's pretty clear it's an anecdote. She was younger. She's telling about something that happened. Some of you said she's at least 20. Some of you said she could have been, or somebody said she could be 50 or 60. We don't know how old she is, but we do know she's an adult, right? And that that's what's, that's what's happening there. Uh, I don't have the, we actually, the poem ends and gives us a specific date uh, that what's going on in the world that's important while they're in world the, war two yeah but not world war two world war two was in the 40s oh it was world war one yeah the world war one it's 19 february 1918 uh the war was on okay is what it is what we hear in the closing paragraph so that's just to ground us a little bit all right let's do what i call a group summary we may have done this before what I mean by that is one person just gives us a simple thing about the uh, poem, the action, the plot of the poem. Another person gives an, the next detail and we sort of step through it in chronological order. We don't need to say but three or four things here. The plot is pretty simple and we've kind of already uh, I did it. But how would you start a plot summary about this? Hannah, what do, how would you start off? We said where this begins. What? How does the poem begin? What's the beginning of the plot here? For the... I don't understand your question. Sorry about that. Okay. A plot is the action of a story. Uh, what happens in a story. At the beginning of this poem, where are we? What's going on? Is that clear? For the girl, for the girl story, or sorry, for the girl, where where does this begin? Where is she at the start of here? Oh, she was at the dentist waiting room. She's at the dentist, and we said she's with her aunt. It says in Worcester, Massachusetts. I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist appointment. Right? Yes. So what happens next? While she's what what happens next in the poem? She picks up the sorry. National Geographic to read. Oh, sorry for cutting you off. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. yeah, the same answer. Yeah. Yeah, she's sitting in the waiting room and she picks up and a magazine. It happens to yes. be National Geographic. Okay. <laughs> what? And she, and you know, and she says, let's see, she says, I waited, I read the National Geographic, I could read in parentheses. So we, that's a clue. She's pretty young. I could read. She's just learned to read. Uh, but a little later, she actually says it's three days before her, her seventh birthday, I believe. So what, ha what, about, what comes up next? She starts to read a magazine. What happens after that? She kind of... She saw a picture. Oh, sorry. Go Who's <laughs> picking? No, go to a new, the new person. Is that Christoph or who is it? Who was trying to speak in addition to Hannah? You go. Oh, it was me. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see your name in the gap. Who is, who's me? Abdi. Okay, go ahead, Adi. I was just going to say, um, she kind of gets uh, overwhelmed by the book because she sees like a lot of different images. Good. She gets overwhelmed and we're going to see how that plays out in some way. And, and, you know, the real mystery of the poem is what's the result of her getting overwhelmed? Overwhelmed's a really good word there. We're going to come to some others that came in your homework. But that gives us the bare outline. She goes to the dentist. She's a little girl. 
She goes to the dentist's office with her aunt. Her aunt's having her appointment. She looks at a National Geographic. Something very weird happens, okay? And let's, let's, that's what we want to understand better. Yeah, I also think that the way she talks about the first photo photograph she sees about the volcano, it could be also a metaphor for what happens to her, which is sort of like an explosion. Excellent, Fernando. No, that, that's a great connection. I haven't heard that before. And uh, she does uh, she does erupt, right? That's a good word, explodes, you know, uh, in response. Uh, and you had some other good words. I, there's some of you whose homework I'm going to quote in a little bit. I'm, spare, I'm saving one that I believed you used, but we're, we'll, we'll come back at the end when we talk about that. But I just wanted to, you know, you probably are familiar with National Geographic. It's been around a long, long time. Uh, I, I probably, you could probably verify how exactly factual this is by going to February 1918 and seeing what was in it. But National Geographic is famous for taking you all over the world, showing you lots of different cultures, lots of different people, uh, just how people live in different places. And Fernanda just touched on this. She said there were images of volcanoes. And I think you know what a volcano is, but I just want you to you know, think about that lava erupting and how violent that is and what a kind of spectacle of nature a volcano is. And that's what, that's what she looked at there. A couple of other things that she named, she names Osa Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, lace, Osa and, and Martin, excuse me, Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. This is a real couple that uh, spent a lot of time in Africa, you know, probably just trying to understand the culture, filming it. There's a museum in their honor, I believe in Kansas City. And so here's some other pictures of them, you know, out uh, uh, in Africa. I'm looking for the word you know, there's a sense of going into another culture where you're trying to be helpful and there's another like you're being a spectator, you're taking advantage of it in some way. They were probably some way in between, but look at how they were almost like uh, movie star figures, you know, and they're making movies about Africa and uh, they became famous for that, all right? Uh, Another image from it, it talks about babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. Here's a picture of that. Why would this be, why would somebody do this to a baby? What are they trying to do? Manny, what do you think? Mani? Um, I'm not really sure. It's all right. Change the shape of the baby's head. For what reason? So it looks more visually appealing in said culture. And that there must be something attached to having a long, taller head. And so this is physically reshaping. In the in I believe this in Japan, you know, there's a there's a culture of of wrapping women's feet so they don't grow and they stay delicate or something. I don't understand that whole phenomenon. But this is a, a way to change, to manipulate the way the body grows. It also says, uh, excuse me, my, my, I can't see all that. Naked, what, uh, hold on just a second. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs, their breasts were horrifying. Here are some images that could be that. This isn't wire, these are beads, but that's like a light bulb. These pictures have naked breasts. I mean, are their breasts horrifying? Why does she think, looking back, why did the child find them horrifying? Because she hasn't been exposed to that before. Apparently not, right, Fernanda? There's something about that that really hits her hard. Uh, and, you know, these are, these are not, this, these are just breasts, you know, there, there doesn't have to be anything horrifying about them. Here's another image of, of the way, you know, like using the string on the head, here's wires on necks that are much more like wire around the light bulb. But those are, you know, those are the kinds of things she's seeing. And, uh, and I think Fernanda hit it, if you had, you know, she hadn't seen this and realized how old is she? She's six. 
And what else, you know, why else might it be embarrassing to look at this? Where is she seeing these pictures? In a public space. Yeah, in a public space with a lot of adults sitting around her. And so, you know, it's not like she's in the privacy of her home or she's with other, you know, six-year-olds and they're giggling over this. Suddenly she's in the middle of this public space seeing pictures like that. And there's something about that that's disturbing enough for the memory to be their breasts were horrifying. All right, so this brings us to our study question. And I ask you, what do you think the speaker experienced in the writing room that made the moment there so memorable? What appears to have caused or triggered that moment? What happened to her in that moment? How was she different because of what happened? And I said, write one or more well-developed paragraphs explaining your ideas about these questions. We've already said some things that are relevant here, okay? Uh, we haven't really said what she experienced, but we've said that she read the, the uh, National Geographic. Fernanda gave us that great connection that, you know, that there's a volcano there and she's going to wind up exploding herself. Uh, and so we know that's where we're headed from the plot summary we did, but we haven't said how she was different or we haven't said what made it so memorable. So we've got a few more questions to think about as we read the poem. Now, let me pause and say again, some of you answered this very nicely. I'm gonna read back some answers in a little bit. Uh, but some of you just, a couple of you just put question marks. A couple of you didn't answer. And when I talked to you in conference, you said you didn't cause you just weren't sure what to say at all. I wanna encourage you all times to try, okay? Just give it a shot. I'm as concerned in your homework that you're trying to answer than whether you answer correctly. So think about that the next time that you think you don't know, quite know what to say about anything. I'm also, you know, I didn't really underscore, but I've had a, a bad experience teaching this poem and that it's the kind of poem that sends people off to the internet saying, well, let me get an explanation somewhere. And I didn't reinforce again, I'm really only interested in your thinking but I was pleased that I didn't get any, any of the good answers I got, even when they were really good. And I Googled some phrases to see if they turned up. They, were, they weren't internet answers, they were original answers. And that's what these should be. This should always be your own work. So let me, let me pause there. I wanna give you a little structure to think about what happened to her. And uh, Tyler, you actually used this word epiphany in your answer. And I want to be sure everybody uses, understands what an epiphany is, okay? Epiphany is, a, is, a, is really a kind of a literary term, but it's for a sudden intuitive perception or insight that, you know, makes you think you're seeing reality in a way you haven't seen it before. And it's usually initiated by some simple commonplace moment or experience. You could think of it as a sudden revelation to an underlying truth about a person or situation. It comes from a Greek word, which meant that the gods have let a mere mortal see what they see in their divinity, like a revelation from the gods. And it first became famous, uh, or it first became used or common in literature through uh, the author James Joyce and some stories he wrote called The Dubliners. He was an Irishman and he had a story, uh, first collection was called The Dubliners, and he made every story kind of incorporate an epiphany of some sort, and that's kind of where the term, term got uh, currency. So uh, here's a, a structure for thinking about an epiphany. It usually involves someone in a state of innocence. They have an experience, and because of that experience, they have a kind of a revelation. They have a new vision that they didn't have before, okay? And so here's, one, here's an example of using something we've already read. We might think of Myop's epiphany this way. She lives in a world, she, she sees the world as beautiful and safe, right? She can on a summer day just go out and roam in the woods and not worry about anything going on there. Uh, it's like you could think of her almost as being in a Garden of Eden 
in my reading classes, I actually used to begin with Adam and Eve and uh, then move to the, uh, the flowers and uh, in the waiting room. But she's, you know, basically, though, we know she's not worried about anything. She's just singing, gathering flowers, very happy. But then she discovers the rotting remains of a man who was lynched. You know, that's a very disturbing thing. That introduces you to death. That introduces you to the shock of just how did this happen? And, you know, uh, a rotting remain can't be a pretty sight, especially if you step down into the skull. Uh, as, as that's how you discover it. But then she not only, is it not only the rotting remains, but the important thing that because there's a noose there, excuse me, because there's a noose there, it suggests that he was lynched. Uh, I, you know, somebody, uh, one of you said, and it's not the first time somebody said that it was a suicide. And, you know, there's no, there's nothing in the story that tells us it isn't. But we do know that Myop is a, a young brown girl, brown skinned girl. We know she's a sharecropper, which was an oppressed status. And we know that lynchings were very common in about for, century, for decades in America. And so all of those things point to a, suggest to, to, to a, a lynching more so than just a suicide in the woods. Uh, so what does she do? What does that what is seeing that? We know that her summer was over. That was a basically, you know, one way we could put words around that is to say that she discovers there's, we could say that she discovers death. We could say she discovers evil and injustice, but something about that is going to leave her in a very different state. Her summer is over. She's not in, innocent anymore. So what, when we read in the waiting room, We've said, we know we've got an innocent, right? We know that she's a, a, it's almost seven. She's just learned to read. That's inherently, you know, in all likelihood, in a very innocent state. So we want to think about what's going to be her experience and what is the, what's the nature of her epiphany? You know, what's the nature of what she learns here? And we've already... Uh, said that it looks like what triggers it is what goes on with the magazine, uh, what she discovers in the what she sees there. So let's read the poem now. And let's see. Now, this is just kind of repeating, but it kind of sets us up. What does a little girl do in the room? What happens to her? What does she experience? What questions does her experience leave her with? She's going to end with a bunch of questions. So I think that what I need to do now, I'm gonna get out of here and good, we have a, a few more folks. Let me, I'm gonna open up the poem. So give me just a second to be sure I'm doing that right. Thank you for your patience. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna read, I'll probably kind of talk out loud as we go. If at any point you have a, a question that you really just wanna stop and ask, feel free to just speak up, okay? But in the waiting room, in Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with my Aunt, Con Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist waiting room. It was winter. It got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. Arctic's an old word like for parkas, you know, winter coats. My aunt was inside my aunt was inside what seemed like a long time. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic, I could read, and carefully studied the photographs. The inside of a volcano, 
black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole, long pig, the caption said. Now, let me pause here. I think I actually tried to look for a 1918 geographic once and I couldn't find this particular figure. But notice here's an encounter with a dead man slung on a pole. We don't know what's going on. Long pig seems very strange. Babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. Now think about that. You can picture this little girl once she's opened this, it's like she doesn't, she, she doesn't want to be discovered reading this. And so she doesn't stop. She just keeps going kind of as an effort not to call more attention to herself. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. Suddenly from inside came an O of pain and Consuelo's voice. Not very loud or long, I wasn't at all surprised. Even then, I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. Now, there, right now, we're under the impression she heard her aunt holler O. Oh. And her opinion of her aunt is that she knew she was a foolish, timid woman. Can you imagine if you're six years old and you've already figured out your aunt's uh, timid and foolish? Mm -hmm. She must have done something, right? There must be something about her behavior. Let's just let's let's dig into that just to say, why might you have thought that an adult was foolish if you were a child? What might? Let's just we don't know what she did. Let's just speculate. Let's try to, a couple of examples of what that might be. Maybe she worried over nothing. Worried over nothing. That would be one trait. What, 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 are, what are some other things or behaviors that might make you question an adult, even at a very young age? Just give us a couple more other people. I think it depends on how you think of yourself as a child and not necessarily on how the adult is. So when you're a child, you think you know everything. So maybe <laughs> that's just her own perception of her aunt. That's a good notion, Fernanda. You're basically saying the ant may not have been foolish, right? The ant might not have been timid. But think of timid. What might that, what might, why might she have thought her aunt was timid? And that's probably a word she may not have known then, but she could put words around being older. Why might she have thought her aunt was timid? Why would you think a grown up was timid? Well, think of it. Maybe she didn't go out much. Maybe she had never married. Maybe she was uh, afraid to look for a new job, you know, or something. There are various things that might make such an impression. But it's interesting that she thinks she understood her aunt enough to think uh, she was foolish and timid. And, and uh, Fernando, that's good to remind us that she may not have been accurate in that. But anyway, she heard the O, she thought it was her aunt. She thought her aunt was foolish and timid. I might've been embarrassed, but wasn't. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice and my mouth. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. I, we were falling, falling. Our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic February 1918. So let's pause again, because now suddenly a couple of big things are happening. One, it wasn't her aunt. It was the little girl herself who said, oh. And uh, my voice in my mouth, without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt, as though she's merged with her aunt. She's become some, a person like her aunt. I, we, we're falling, falling. 
Was she literally falling? No, it's a metaphor. Is it uh, and uh, a metaphor for what? She, um, well, like, uh, like with the chart that you pulled up, like she's innocent at first, and now she feels herself like sinking through that, like, um, like sinking into reality, kind of. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm sorry, who's speaking? I can't see all the people at once. Abdi. Thank you. Abdi, the, uh, Abdi, the, yeah, she's starting, she, you know, it, 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 like you said, she's, she's starting to move into this experience, but she's falling, falling, and, and she's almost pulling her aunt with her, I, we, uh, but those were good words, those were good words there. It's, you know, something's happening, something's starting to go. All right, let's keep going now. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round turning world into cold blue black space. Now again, is she, she's trying to stop the sensation. Is she literally falling off the round turning world into a blue black space? She's not, right? She's just, she's, but she's that, she's that, she's having that of a emotional response, or that emotion, that much of an emotional response. This is She's like, spiraling further into her, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh, I said she, she's spiraling further into her own mind. Into her own life, but no, also though, she's also spiraling into, I don't know what to make of this, blue black mm -hmm. space. Blue black space isn't a great place to be, right? I mean, it's like it's almost almost like a, a, a void opening up. But look at what she has, how she keeps thinking. But I felt you are an I. You are an Elizabeth. You are one of them. Why should you? Why should you be one too? Who are who are who are them? The women. Uh, which women, Fernanda? The ones that she was reading about and I, her aunt and everyone else. I think that's a good answer. I think that's about as specific. That's at least one reference. Those are the only women. There are also women in the, in the room. There's also her aunt. So it could be multiples. But I think that the point is suddenly she's seeing herself connected to other people, other women. And... She's and, and notice she says, you are an I. That's like saying, you are a person, you are an Elizabeth. What is this? And you're one of them. Why should you be one too? I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. And that does suggest maybe she couldn't look back in that magazine at those uh, at the at the women there. I scarcely, I'm sorry, let me find my place. I, I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. I gave a sidelong glance. I couldn't look any higher at shadowy gray knees, trousers and skirts and boots and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I knew nothing stranger had ever happened that nothing stranger could ever happen. Now here, you know, she can't look up but here she's clearly looking at the other people in the waiting room, right? So there's some kind of a connection. Uh, there's some kind of a connection with her here uh, to the pe excuse me, to the people in the room here, more so than just the magazine. But she's, you know, now she's being very self-conscious. I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened, that nothing stranger could ever happen. She's had some kind of implosion inside her that is that that's leaving her in a different state. Now she keeps met, she keeps going here, or at least in retrospect. Why should I be my aunt or me or anyone? Now this is 
posed very simply, why should I be my aunt or me or anyone? But uh, one of you you're going to see said that she's asking the big questions of existence. Why am I here? <laughs> you know, what, how, you know, what is it? All of us are very improbable, you know, in the, in the, you know, given the scale of the universe and the link, you know, how, how, the, how, how minute any moment is, how, 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 uh, I'm sorry, how does she put it? Uh, why should I be here or me or anyone? Every, the whole world is improbable at some level. You, you, it's hard to imagine how it ever came about, which we're always still trying to figure it out. What similarities, boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat. Now here definitely she's connecting to her aunt and family and just the people in the room or even the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts. Now again, they're, this is the way it comes back to her it's, uh, it, at her age as though they're awful. And when, you know, that's, that's very much the pain of somehow I wasn't ready for this, I think. Uh, let me back up though. What similarities, boots, hands, and the family voice, the family voice I felt in my throat, or even the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts held us together or made us all just one? What what connects us? What are the similarities that make us all just one? How, I didn't know any word for it. How unlikely, I used the word improbable late or earlier. I think I was anticipating this. How unlikely that all these things are there. How had I come to be here like them and overhear a cry of pain that could have been, that could have got loud and worse, but hadn't. The waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath the black wave and another and another. Now again, is there, are there black waves going through the waiting room? Not literally, right? But that's, a, that's an indicator uh, a metaphor someone said earlier of her internal state. The waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath the big black wave, another and another. Then I was back in it. The war was on outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, where night and slush, uh, excuse me, the war was on outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, were night and slush and cold and it was still the 5th of February, 1918. So pretty much at the end here, she leaves and goes away, you know, and just goes back outside. But suddenly she's much more aware, you know, she's more the, the war, she brings in the war and she know, we know exactly where she is in the place. But she's had a very strange experience there. Now I'm a little, one thing I'm a little frustrated by, I don't think I can keep up the poem and the uh, and my slides, and I need to go back to my slides. So let me ask you, uh, do you have, can you open up your copy of the poem uh, that's in the reading folder? That might be a good idea if you can, if you didn't print it out already. But if you could go to the assignment folder and go to readings and open the uh, poem, you can be looking at it uh, while I'm back with our slides. So let me come back here. Okay, so I think that, you know, it's easy enough now to plug in that it's something about looking at that geographic that triggers her response, that triggers her epiphany. And now we wanna think about what was that epiphany. And we went through the poem pretty carefully, so I'm not sure we're gonna to need to go back. What I want us to look at is some answers that different students gave, okay, of what happened to her. And so the first one's pretty concise. Tyler, this is yours. Could you mind reading this for us? Uh, 
Tyler, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. In Elizabeth Bishop's in the waiting room, the thing that the speaker experiences was a sense of realization when it comes to growing up. The epiphany affected her by showing her the fact that she's going to change someday. The trigger for this epiphany was caused by her viewing the adult human female body from a National Geographic. Okay, so unpack a little bit slowly, especially. You're, you're focusing on the, the pictures of the women, right? And you say that it showed her that her uh, that she was going to change. She's going to change someday. What did you mean by that? And growing up, that that these figures that horrify her now will be her body someday. Okay, she's not going to be a little girl forever, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So there's there's one take on that of helping understand. Some of you gave a little bit more. Let's go to this one. Uh, Let's see. I think Luther, I believe this is you. Luther, could you read this one for us? Um, Elizabeth kept herself busy by reading National Geographic magazine. She finds herself fascinated by images that's in the magazine. She sees photographs of Osa and Martin George, um, Johnson dressed in riding breeches, lace boots, and piff helmets. A dead man slug on the pole, babies with pointed heads, round went round and round with stringing black naked women whose neck with wire like the necks of light bulbs. Oh, uh, reading this oh, 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 Luther. I just want to put, look at how what nice detail there is there. He brought into all the images uh, that were the things that startled her, not just National Geographic, but all of these images. Keep going. While reading this magazine, she hears her aunt Concilo yells, um, yell of pain. At first, Elizabeth knew that her aunt was a foolish, timid woman. She realizes that she yelled in the same manner. She experiences this strange and dreamlike sensation of falling off the ground with both of aunt's eyes and her and hers glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. The experiences above are memorable to Elizabeth because it leads her to think about the life's great questions of ex existence. Very good. So the life's great questions of existence, you know, why am I here? Where am I going? How did we all get here? Those are the things that she's puzzled with. And uh, this strange dreamlike sensation, that's a good way to describe, you know, those waves that she was feeling, the, uh, uh, the black falling into blue black space, the whole, the whole uh, waiting room being hit with wave after wave. So this was another, this was a good full answer too. Uh, let's look at a couple more. Fernanda, I believe this is you. Do you mind reading for us? Yes, one second. It was a prominent moment for Elizabeth because it marked a breakthrough from her childhood innocence to the adult world. In some ways, it shows she was having sort of a panic attack after she realized she was similar to the women she was reading about. Pause there a second. That word panic attack is very good, right? Uh, I didn't want to say that earlier. That's a good, I didn't want to spoil that, but that's a good way to think about. She virtually has a panic attack. You could talk, you, you might come up with other things, but she's, she's clearly like something triggers something very deep. But I thought that was, that was a, that was a good, a good way to frame it. Thank it you. Go oh, ahead. It shocked her the way the women were shown in, in images, but she kept on reading the magazine. After seeing all those images, she describes a moment where she hears an O oh coming out of the dentist room. She imagined her own voice to be her aunt's, aunt's voice. And to, then she visualized herself to be uh, she visualized herself to be a strong and a unique person and her aunt to be a timid and foolish woman. When that happened, she saw similarities and also to all the other in the waiting room was a representation of what and that has had a profound impact on her. Okay. Fernanda, right there at the end, we got some feedback or something, but uh, so I'm just going to repeat this in case y'all couldn't hear it either. What that happened, when that happened, she saw similarities between her and her aunt, her aunt, and all to those other, and also to all those other women, like in the magazine in the waiting room. 
and the waiting room was a representation of what she became of when she became just one more woman that's good just one more woman among all others you know this you said a couple of things here that i think uh hit really good tunes to really good notes hold on just a second She imagined her own, until then she visualized herself to be a strong and unique person. Now, I wonder as a child how strong and unique, but I like that. She clearly feels superior to her aunt. But you know, one of the, I hope that you had this growing up, one of the pleasures of childhood, a lot of people make us feel very special. It's like we're the greatest gift to the world. And uh, I hope that you had some of that. I got a big dose of it because I had, I was the first male in my family, in, a, in my mother's side of the family, after about seven girls in a row or something. So they used to tease I was the prince. But, the, but I hope in your own way, you were allowed to feel special. And that's part, you know, that, that's one way I would interpret what Fernanda says here, uh, as much as strong and unique. But she did definitely feel superior. The other thing Fernanda adds really well here, too, uh, a representation when she would just become one more woman among all the others. And that has a profound impact on her. Yeah, think about that, that when we grow up, we're much more ordinary in some way. We're just one more adult in the world where you're no longer cared for in the same way. And I think that's a, that's a good way to express kind of a, a vision of what could be different is you're just one more person, uh, not not, not, and you may be one more person who's just as foolish and timid as your aunt you think you're better than, you know. Uh, that's kind of what got revealed there. So these were, these are, I hope these give you a, a good lens into the poem. I'm, we're going to look at one more. Uh, last time I looked, I didn't see Johnny. Johnny, are you here now? You are? Oh, are you the I? Is Johnny here? I can't tell. I thought that I was hearing a response, but if I'm not hearing one, I better just read this myself. Okay. So, um, Professor Kenny, were you going by alphabetical order? No, not really. I just arranged them in the air in the order I wanted to read them. Oh, okay. Um, do can I read? I joined the class late about. Who, who's speaking? Ismahan. Okay, Ismahan, go ahead. You can read this. Okay. I believe what triggered the moment was the National Geographic magazine that she was reading. She described the magazine and all the crazy things she saw and read in it. Made her aware of how big the world is, but yet how intertwined we all are. She left that office and described the war outside. She also mentioned the fear of falling off this round earth in, on, into a black abyss. The moment gave her a ton of insight into the bigger picture of the world, the real picture, not the picture we paint of the world to a child. Thank you, Ms. I appreciate you reading that. Okay, mm -hmm. look, this has, this has a, you, you, you hear some things we've heard in the other answers, but I think there's some new twist here too that is very good. I love the, oh, excuse me. I love this, made her aware of how big the world is. You know, that's one thing that we don't know as a child. Our world is very small, you know, uh, whether it's our family, our neighborhood, our grandparents, it tends to be, it tends to be, we're not aware of a larger world and all the conflict in it. Uh, uh, how big the world is, and yet how intertwined we all are, how we're all connected. And to some degree, she felt herself suddenly connected with people that seemed very different from her. And when she went outside, uh, she, you know, she was aware of the, she noted the bigger things in the world. And then she mentions the fear of falling off into an abyss. That moment gave her a ton of insight into the bigger picture. And this is nice, the, the real picture, not the picture we paint of the world to a child. And let's just think about that a second. We both, when we're children, we are both given pictures of the world that aren't gonna hold up very well. 
that are much more innocent, that are much more simple. But then as, as grown-ups, we do that for children too. We simplify the world for them. And so I like that emphasis in Johnny's answer of the real picture, not the picture we paint of the world to a child. Uh, one answer I didn't clear, does that, but this, I hope this, any questions about these answers I've read though, do they, or that everyone read for us, or these, do these help you see what went on there? And we'll take the silence as a yes. I was just going to highlight one more answer I didn't pull in. Uh, Hannah made a nice connection between the, the uh, Osa and Martin Johnson and their breeches and their hat and the naked women. And, you know, that somehow that contrast was, was startling too. And I thought that was a good insight as well. But now having gone over these in detail, and I, ho I hope now, I hope now you have a good grasp of the poem. And if you don't, there'll be a chance in a minute to ask more questions. But let's go back and look. I, I think I messed up here. I meant to not do this all in one spot, but we can sort of fill in now, having heard those. We had the little girl that uh, couldn't read. She sees the geographic and people from all over the world. And one, you know, one, you could put this a lot of different ways. We heard different things there. But basically, she's, she does suddenly understand the world is large and complicated. And I'm a person in that world. What would become of me? I think maybe the only other thing that would have been important to add to the epiphanies, what a couple of you said, she sees she's not going to be a little girl forever. She's going to grow up. She's going to become a woman, a woman in the world. And I think that's a really, you could, you could frame that as being even a real important part of this. Uh, maybe that gets at what will become of me, but I, I would expand that based on what y'all had said, uh, some of the answers you gave to really emphasize that she's not gonna be a little girl. And I do think that's one of, one of the ways people often talk about this poem is that seeing no. those, what she, no, calls, <laughs> what she calls horrifying breasts uh, are a way of saying, uh, I'm going to become a woman. And the waiting room is where you wait to become a grown up, is a kind of, it's a metaphor that gets working there. Okay. So let's see. So some closing thoughts. Do you see the overlap with the flowers in the waiting room? What's the simple overlap between these two stories? And one's a story, one's a poem, but this poem has a story in it. What's the overlap? They both stem from a loss of uh, somewhat innocence. Yeah, I mean, they're both dealing with a an encounter with the world, very different encounters, but one with a, a corpse or a rotting remains of a corpse, the other with a National Geographic, that, that wind up giving the, the children a jolt that changes their view of the world. Let me, as a footnote, let me say, there's a long tradition in literature that books are dangerous, okay? That books, books make you think about things in new ways. And so that's, that's also kind of played out there in the National Geographic. If you're familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, what, when Adam and Eve bite from the apple, what God forbids, or when they're in the Garden of Eden, before they bite, God's told them not to, not to eat an apple from the tree of knowledge. Knowledge can be dangerous, okay? Knowledge can be disruptive. And so that's part of what you get with the National Geographic. So can we say simply what the, wa what the waiting room's about? Let, or, you know, what, what, what is this? What's going on in this poem? I'll take a stab. Um, I think just summarizing it, it's just uh, growing up is difficult. And one part of that is realizing that you're just a small part of the world or you're just another part, another person. That's great. That's, you know, it's who is who was that speaking? Because I didn't see, I couldn't see it in my gallery view. <laughs> it's Abdi again. 
I'd be good. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a I think that's a good answer. You know that it is about it's a it's a little look at what it is to be wrenched into understanding you're going to grow up and that growing in as a grown up you're going to be in a very different spot in the world. You could answer it various ways, but that's a good one. All right. Here's another thing. Why do you think she chose to write about this experience? Didn't you just answer that for us? How so? Uh, like it was in the waiting room for like waiting to be an adult. Well, but why was it? Uh, what, well, let, let me phrase it. Why do you think this was memorable to her? Why was it an important experience, important enough to write about? There's not just one answer there. You could say a variety of things. Why was this, in, why was this important to her? Why was it memorable? The, 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 I already said this in like the thing I wrote, but uh, it was memorable because it gave her an epiphany about, uh, about what was going to happen in the future that she had never gotten before. So it stuck with her. Yeah. I think that I think that something like that is true. This was like a, a pivotal moment for her, right? This was she had a new vision, she had an epiphany that changed her sense of herself. And that's what she's trying to capture for us in the poem. Now, I'm gonna this last question, I just want you to think about this. Doesn't this poem sound very real? I mean, don't you feel like this you 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 can picture this as a memory someone had? They may be looking back and embellishing it in some way, but it feels like it happened. Do you agree? Yes, no? Yes. It feels very real. But, you know, I think we need to just consider, we don't know this is a true story. And this is part of what the magic of uh, poetry and storytelling is, that, you know, it could be true. It could have you know, it could have absolutely been she experienced, but it's also true by telling it, she convinces us it's true. She gives us details. It was in Worcester. It was in the dentist office. There's a National Geographic. Uh, this is what my aunt was like. This is what I thought of my aunt. You know, there are all these details that weave a story that are very convincing. And I mainly... <clears throat> I wouldn't doubt at all, and I actually, I'm sure that somewhere there's an answer to this question. I wouldn't doubt at all that something similar may have happened, but I would be astonished if, if it made, somebody please silence yourself. I would be astonished if, uh, if it, at six, it made as much sense to her as it now makes looking back. Uh, it, you know, it could have been she's, uh, a child would get the jolt and the adult figures out what was going on. But I mainly want to just leave you, uh, I want you to just ponder that or realize that whenever we read fictions and poems, uh, they often are convincing us they're true, but there, there are various ways to, to help us learn important stories as much as anything. They don't have to be true to be valuable is another way to put it. We have a, a we have, we tend to think that things that are happened and are real or more valuable than fiction sometimes and that isn't necessarily the case a fiction can be uh all the more it can be as valuable as anything all right so that's with that i'm going to move now to talk about your writing assignments okay who who's here is nana i didn't i don't you, can, who is that? Just so I know. All right. Uh, wait, that's not what I wanted. Excuse me just a second. I'm going to get you. Your writing assignment up in just a minute. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to your assignments folder and to essay assignments. 
So notice <clears throat> I've put in one assignment sheet that's for flowers or the waiting room and one assignment sheet that's for girl. You only need to write on one of those three. So either flowers or the waiting room or girl, not all three. <clears throat> Let's take up the assignment sheet first for the flowers and the waiting room. And let's see, Hannah, do you mind reading the first paragraph for us? Okay. The flowers and the waiting room was the was defect a moment when a young girl discovers something about the world and herself that ch changes the way she thinks of herself forever. Can you, can you identify a moment in your life where some, something you experienced dramatically changed the way you thought of yourself in the world around you? Okay, thank you. So okay. now, you're gonna, you can see this is gonna involve you talking about what happened in either the waiting room or the flowers and then making a connection for yourself, okay? So, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, let me see if I can get more. Ismahan, why don't you read the next, please? Okay, write an essay comparing what Maya or Elizabeth experienced to your own experience. Focus on what triggered Maya or Elizabeth. Explain what triggered your discovery and how it changed you. Support your analysis of Maya or Elizabeth with details from the story or poem. Support your depiction of your own experience with specific details. In your conclusion, underscore what was most important about your discovery about yourself. Thank you, Mahan. And so, and you know, I, I've tacked on here. When I first wrote this, I didn't use the- You want me to keep going? No, you can read that next one. Go ahead. Okay. You might think of this essay as looking at a moment of moving from innocence to experience. And I guess I should say moments. The moving from innocence to experience in the story or poem, and then in your own life. I didn't have that originally, but given the way we talked about it, I thought maybe, I hope that that would help. <clears throat> now, let me, let's be clear. You know, Myop in, uh, encountered something violent and you know, that, you, you, it, that could be something that would be important in your own experience. Elizabeth had a simpler thing that was just about realizing I'm not gonna be a child forever. And you know, but so what, she had a different kind of epiphany. And so when you think about your own that you want to talk about, which one does it match up better with? And what you're trying to do, uh, if, you, if you come down here, I'm asking again for a minimum of four paragraphs where you introduce, and the introduction would just make it clear you're going to talk about these two, what happened in the story and what happened to you and kind of how they're connected. But then you're going to have at least one paragraph about the story uh, where you focus on my up and or Elizabeth and you focus on what triggered them and what the result was. And then you're going to have at least one or more about your own experience. And then in the conclusion, as we set up above here, you say, come back to why it was important. All right. Uh, but but the this is just assuming that you've experienced something similar. One thing I feel fairly confident of, there's no one on the line who still thinks they're a pure child, okay? And so I have to think, in, 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 and let me also say, we don't only go through, we don't lose our innocence once. We continue to lose our innocence throughout life about one belief or another, okay? Uh, one disappointment or another. You know, one, we, we, let me try to make that more specific, you know, like you may have great ideas about a marriage and about your love for someone, and then you have to face up to that was mistaken. That's a kind of loss of innocence too, of putting too much stock in something that, that winds up failing you. 
So, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a childhood experience, <clears throat> but that's, that's your first assignment. The rest of it, and you know, that's the first option, two options. And again, you're only writing on one or the other. The rest of this is just reminding you, get started early, plan, write, proof and correct yourself. You've got two weeks to so do a really good job. Do your best work is what you want to do. Any questions about this essay? All right, I hope that's clear. The other one's kind of different. We're, we're a little short for time and it's because I have trouble. Well, wait, let's see. Uh, Christoph, why don't you read the this part for us. Could you do that, please? Um, yes. Thank you. So um, write an essay explaining your opinion of the parenting in no, girl. Start, start here, start at the top. Do you... All right, gotcha. Uh, do you admire the parenting in girl? Why or why not? Write an essay explaining your opinion of the parenting in girl. Describe the parenting in the story as you understand it using details from the story as evidence, then focus on your opinion of that parenting. Why you admire it or why don't you support your opinion with examples of parenting you've experienced and or strive for or will strive for as a parent. Thank you. So now I'm using a word here with girl that we didn't use before, parenting. And that's because I'm taking all that long litany, that long list of advice to be an attempt to parent, to guide the girl, to help her grow up in the way that the adult thinks is proper. And so I want, what I want you to consider, do you think it was good parenting? And you could say, yes, I think it's a good parenting for these reasons, you know, or I think it was, this was not the kind of parenting I admire for these reasons. Or you could say, I think it was good, but it was flawed. You know, you could, you know, here's the good parts, here's what wasn't. But what I want you to do is to, 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 to comment on the parenting and then, and then explain your opinion. And I would like you to explain your opinion about whether it was good or bad or whatever, using some of your own values, either what, how you were parented in contrast or how you intend to parent that wouldn't be like this. But this is trying to get you to think about uh, what kind of parenting went on there. And let me, let's see, I've got one, one other idea is flashing through my brain uh, that I thought was, that could be helpful here. You know, you, you, you may, it, there are various ways it could work. You could not care for that parenting and you could describe uh, in saying why you don't, your experience might also be the experience of bad parenting, things you wish your parents had done differently. Maybe there are details in here that, that remind you of things that, that you wish your parents had chosen not to do, okay? So there are various ways you could, you could approach it. But again, uh, you introduce what you're gonna talk about and you know, one we're going to talk up after this about we're going to talk more about introductions and conclusions, and and I'm, it will, I'll give you more guidance. But you you can introduce your essay without guidance at this point, and then but you're going to have an introductory paragraph. Then you're going to have at least one paragraph that describes what you see as the 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 quality of parenting in girl, and then you're going to elaborate on that by explaining why you think it's the, the way it is, good, bad, however, based on your own experience or your own values about parenting. And then you will again conclude. Uh, I left off here what to do in the conclusion, but again, just say why you think that your view of, of parenting, what you had to say about parenting is important. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, it's 12.42, so hold on a second. Let me come back here. 
And we're only going to go for another minute or so, but hold on, I want to. Yeah, one thing I, I want to say thank you to everyone who arranged a one on one this week. Last week, your one of your things was to set up a one on one. Uh, I'm disappointed, though, to say, you know, there are 20 students and I've only heard from 10 of you. And so I really would like to touch base with you, make sure things are going OK and express, you know, just hear any concerns you have and just for us to get a chance to talk. So uh, it's it, you did if you didn't do it this week, you should figure out when you can and propose some times to for me. Several of you have already started to revise your narrative or did, did revise your narrative. And if you have, I'll be looking at that pretty soon. OK, uh, but everyone has an assignment of revising your personal narrative. So let me to just to be clear about the homework coming up, you're going to write about. Uh, excuse me, you're going to write about one of these three things, the flowers, the waiting in the waiting room or girl. It's not due till the night before our next class, <clears throat> which if you were late, it won't be until our next class is not till the 26th. Next week we have a, a vacation week. So no class next Friday. So if you haven't already, complete your revision of your personal narrative. That's your other assignment. If you've done it, good work. So, is Mahan please you? Thank you. The uh, so as for your journal, here's your journal assignment. If you are caught up on your journal, if you've been doing it all along, you can take off the spring break week, or if you want to keep writing keep writing, but you have the option not to write next week, but you would write the following week. If you've not been keeping up with your journal, you know, now's the time. You've been waiting too long, but uh, now's the time for you to do that. I'm, uh, one of the other things over the break, I'm going to be looking at your revised narratives and at your journals. I have commented on most of those at least once or more, but I will be looking at it before we meet again, okay? So, uh, what we didn't do today, hold on a second. Oh, I thought I had one, more. oh yeah, we didn't get to bullet in the brain. And so I, I felt like I knew I wanted to talk at length about um, uh, in the waiting room and I didn't wanna hurry this, so I want you, uh, probably your other assignment that I should add to it is be sure that by the time we meet next, you've read Bullet in the Brain and you've done this. Some of you have already answered these questions, but if you haven't, that is going to be due by our next class and I'll add that to the homework that I post, okay? So we will take up Bullet in the Brain in the next class and uh, that's your, you have no re new reading. If you've already done this, you don't have any new reading. You just have your essay assignment. If you haven't completed this homework, you need to. All right. And uh, so let me stop there. And we're just a couple, any, any questions on the homework or any of the rest? Okay. Well, listen, have a very good break. Nice to be with you this morning. I hope that that was helpful and I look forward to, you do have a very good, enjoy your week off, but do also good work on, do good work on your next essay and I look forward to reading it. And if you have any questions, let me hear from you, okay? Have, goodbye, Mr. Likas. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Adi? Yes, Professor. <coughs> I'm did here. I, did I say that right? I, I thought you were saying AD. Yes, AD. AD. Okay. Yeah. So, 
AD, I wanted to be a little, little bit more, uh, hold on a second. Israel, are you, are you still here? Hey, AD, instead of yes. talk, talking, do you, do you, do you have a, can you call me on my phone? Uh, sorry. Well, we can talk. That's okay. I was yeah. going to ask you to call so that it wouldn't be part of the recording. It's okay. Listen, what I wanted to do, though, I wanted to be a little bit more specific. Instead of just saying, write your letter and do your narrative, could you do your letter by Tuesday? Tuesday? Yeah. I, want you, I just want you to have a deadline instead of having two essays. And when you finish your letter, I'm going to tell you which one to do next. Okay. okay. Uh, meaning, meaning it may be your personal narrative. I may go ahead and get you to do this assignment, but let me see your letter first. In this new assignment is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, did you see my essay? On girl? Uh, no, not girl. No. Uh, there's a Addis Ages essay in Doc's office. Okay, no, I have not oh. seen it. So which was that? Is that your personal narrative or your letter? Uh, just a minute. It was... Uh, It was not a uh, girl and a uh, waiting room. It was like uh, how you overcome your uh, problems. Okay, hold on just a second. I don't see it in your folder. Uh, can you go back? Is it in homework? No. No. Where, where do you think it is? Is it in the assignments? Uh, can you give me a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The last. Did you see? Now I see it. Just a second. Okay. So is this your personal narrative? Is that the assignment it's doing? Yes. Personal narrative. Okay. Good. All right. I will move it to your own folder. Okay, it shouldn't be in uh, here. It, yeah. should, it should be in your own folder. So what I want you to uh, do okay. next, I want you to do, let me go slower. I'm going to the essay assignment. And okay. I, want, I want you to next do this letter. And this is what I want you to have to me by Tuesday. Okay. And after I've read it, I will let you know what your next thing will be. Okay. Okay. So thank you for getting that first one in. One other thing, Abdi, though, I wanted to be sure you understand is that, um, let's go back to your folder. All right, AD. Okay. I call some things homework and some things essays. And before you had said something like, I have my essay on girl. If, if I give you uh -huh. homework where you're answering questions, that's what I, I, I consider homework. As long as I'm giving you a question and you're only writing a short answer or a paragraph, that's homework. Essays are when you have a topic and you write a longer piece. Do you understand the difference? Yes. Okay. Homework is uh, shorter, essays longer. And... In the homework, you have a much more specific question. 
about a single reading. Okay. I'm giving you, okay. you're answering a set of questions. And in the essays, you just have a topic you're writing about. Okay. okay. And, and so I just wanted to be sure you knew that. And I only did that because you said something about, uh, I have my essay on girl and I hadn't assigned an essay on girl yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's why I wanted to just be sure that you were clear. If you did your homework on girl, it would go in this folder. Okay. okay. If you had done your homework on in the waiting room, it would go in this folder. Okay. All right. So I look forward to reading your essay and I'll be back in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You take care.